Uh, thanks, everybody, and thanks for coming to hear me talk. Uh, I promise I will be as fun as the beach party. So, uh, so quick show of hands. Uh, who here is either dealing with or is going to have to deal with a lot of real-time data very shortly? Yeah, so a little bit of a selection bias, I guess. Uh, uh, and how many of you are despairing that you might have to turn to like Go or Scala or Clojure or some other, yeah. Well, I'm here to tell you there's a better way. Uh, you can actually now use Storm and StreamParse to, um, to do that without writing a single line of Scala or Clojure. Uh, all right, so just a, a quick background for those of you who aren't familiar with the, um, the difficulties of doing a Python like uh, multi-core programming. Uh, I'm sure somebody is having a fist fight about this very topic right now somewhere in the building. Uh, but Python has the gill. Uh, does everybody here know what the gill is? Or the, the Python's global interpreter lock? Yeah, so a few hands. Uh, for those of you who don't, uh, Python doesn't actually do true um, uh, multi, uh, doesn't compute on every thread at once. There's a global interpreter lock that prevents bytecode from executing on different threads simultaneously. This is normally not an issue for things like uh, I.O. bound tasks, like fetching data from the internet or fetching data from disk, that sort of thing. Um, but the moment you try to do any sort of computationally intensive task on more than one thread, uh, you get lock contention, you get slowdowns, uh, you get all sorts of terribleness. Uh, uh, traditionally, the way this has been dealt with, um, and I'm sure many of you here are familiar with this, uh, is with a queue and worker system, which bypasses the which bypasses the gills, the traditional way to sidestep the gill. So you've got, you've got a queue, which is like Redis or RabbitMQ, one of those things. Then you have workers like RQ or Celery that pull things off the queue, do some sort of uh, processing on them, and push them into another queue, which another worker pulls from, and so on and so forth. Um, this gets a little hairy. Oh, uh, and also, um, um, we're not just interested in beating the gill anymore. Uh, we're going to max out even the largest of boxes, so we need something that can not only scale out to multi-core, but can scale out to multi-node or cluster implementation as we spin up, because it will max out even the biggest AWS instance eventually. Um, just quick before I continue, there's a really great in-depth dive into the, into the gill and like lock contention, and a lot of the arguments around it our CTO gave that I have a link to that we'll share in the slides after. Um, anyway, the, the queue and worker architecture um, can lead to really, really uh, complex diagrams. Uh, this, is, um, this is a diagram of what the Parsley architecture looked like a couple years before I came on board. Um, and it was, quite frankly, uh, it, was, it was tough to onboard new engineers with. It was tough to keep track of. Uh, you had queues. You had workers pulling from different queues, pushing to new queues, pushing to all sorts of different databases. And you had to keep track of which to deploy where, what had been deployed when. And it was. Uh, um, it, was, it, was, it was tough and it took a lot of maintenance and uh, just manpower to, to keep it going. Um, but we found Storm and Storm is fantastic. Um, Storm is purpose built, it's a distributed real time computation system uh, that simplifies this whole worker and queue business. Um, and now thanks to Parsley's work with StreamParse and PyStorm, uh, we have a completely native interface uh, to Storm that, that lets you uh, write your code and deploy it to a cluster. Um, um, without having to write a single line of Clojure or Java or anything you don't want to write. Uh, just a quick, quick background on us and what we use Storm for. Um, we are a web analytics company um, and we do content analytics for digital storytellers. So like Condé Nast, Mashable, uh, and we ingest uh, tons and tons of page view, heartbeat, uh, event data for these publishers so they can more easily track um, visitor loyalty, you know, uh, engage time on page, how many page views certain sections or tags or posts got, et cetera. Uh, and we use this, this data to power dashboards like these, which are available to editors, writers, anybody within the organization to see their performance, and also to power on-site APIs. Uh, so if you've ever seen uh, what's trending or what's popular or you might like, we offer a robust API system to pull data out of, uh, out of our system and into populate front-end widgets. We also offer just recently uh, I, um, a data pipeline, which is access to our raw data. Um, so not only now are we, are we processing data to these dashboards with the API, we're now enriching uh, bare metal data for our customers to build their own dashboards or products or uh, whatever they'd like to build on it. Um, 
a lot of times when I'm with other programmers, um, when I talk about what we do and the scale at which we do it, uh, I hear a few things that maybe you guys have heard. Uh, Python can't do this. The free lunch is over. Python doesn't scale. It's just a scripting language or a glue language. Uh, well, you should have used Go, Rust, Scala, C, Java, name it, someone's recommended it to us. Uh, except Python can scale. Uh, that's a screenshot of HTOP running across a couple of machines, and that's all of our cores uh, maxed out uh, using just a storm, couple storm topologies we, depl we deployed to the cluster. Um, and it scales quite well. Uh, this is just a quick overview of the amount of data that we, that we took in in 2016. It's a lot of data. Um, I think just, just the US election day alone, we brought in, I think, like two or three billion events. Um, and it's all, done, it's all done in Python. So Python can scale. Uh, Storm can help you, and so can StreamParse. And I'm here to help you do that. Um, so StreamParse is uh, Pythonic Storm. It's an open source um, toolkit we've developed to help you get off the ground using Storm. As the name implies, uh, lets you parse real-time streams of data. You can integrate your own Python code with Apache Storm, which runs on the JVM, so there's a multi-lang interface. Uh, it's got a great quick start and documentation, uh, good command line and tooling, and it's production tested. We use it every day, it's very mature. Um, it, it runs the absolute core of our real-time streaming system. So, um, and yeah, it's good for anything that requires sub-second sub latency, or latency. So analytics, logs, sensors, uh, these sort of things. So what we're gonna just quickly try and cover is what's storm topology and how do I use it to process my data? How does it do it internally? How can we use Python with it? Quick overview of stream parse, and then some examples of distributed systems that we do uh, at, at Parsley. Um, how many of you here are familiar with storm or have used storm already? Quite a few, perfect. So then uh, I can try to push through this a little quickly for those of you who know what's going on. Um, Storm uses a couple of different abstractions for, uh, to describe the overall computational graph that you create. Uh, you've got a tuple, which is just a, 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 an individual record of data that's passing through the, the Storm topology. You've got a spout, which is a source of data. Uh, you've got a bolt, which is a component that processes input um, and sends it along the topology. The input can be a spout or another bolt. Um, and the topology, which is the, um, the overall design, it's a collection of components that create the computational graph. Um, and here's kind of an example of what that might look like. You've got a spout, um, which can be any source of incoming data. It can be Redis, it can be a queue, it can be Kafka, um, what have you. Uh, Redis and Kafka overwhelmingly are the, the spouts people use, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, and then you've got different bolts that it passes the data onto. Um, you have to do different sorts of processing, filtering, transformation, whatever it is you're doing to the data. And usually the final step is uh, some sort of, of ETL process uh, into Cassandra, Elasticsearch, what have you. Um, so a tuple, just a single data record. Uh, and you can think of it just like a, like a Python tuple. So the field spec here is uh, word, the word is dog. If it's word and count, you've got dog and then an integer um, as, the, as the second value. Um, and here's, uh, here's an example of a spout, what well, might be an incoming spout. This is kind of a, an arbitrary spout. It comes from our uh, quick start, from our sample uh, word count topology. And you can see here, um, this is basically just a spout that um, cycles through a predefined list of words and emits the words. Um, the important part, of course, being that it's written entirely in Python. Um, you don't have to go into Clojure or Scala or anything. Um, Oh, well, I skipped ahead of myself a bit. Uh, but yeah, um, spouts can be any source of input. It doesn't have to be continuous. Um, a lot of people, um, there's some confusion here. You, uh, uh, it's totally okay for a spout to, to stay idle or sleep a little bit and pull um, an incoming data source for new, it doesn't have to be a, a continuous stream of events. So you can use it for even things that just get, um, that have like burst streaming every now and then, you can still use a spout for. Uh, and it will be totally fine. And in fact, we use it that way as well. Um, here's an example of a bolt. Um, so you can see here, um, the, the bolt uh, takes in a tuple that we just passed to it uh, from, the, from the spout. 
and in the process command that you override from the, from the bold class, uh, you can just do whatever you need to do with the word. In this case, we're arbitrarily incrementing a counter uh, based on whatever the word happened to be. Um, but you can do things far more complex than that, of course. Uh, and once you've uh, processed the tuple, you can then pass it on. So you can, you can create very complex uh, computational graphs this way. Um, and a topology is simply the description of, um, of, the graph, of the graph itself. So you can see here, nothing crazy. Uh, we've got our word count topology, we've got a word spout, and then we've got a word count bolt that takes input from word spout, groups on the word field, which we'll cover in just a second, um, and has a parallelism of two. And so you can describe your entire topology. This is a very simple one. You can have big topologies with many bolts and spouts, um, and you'll be, you'll be good. Uh, this is just a quick overview of that, so you've got um, um, your input, your output. So the count bolt has the word spout as its input. Uh, count bolt outputs words. You can see how it, it outputs the, um, the enriched tuple. So the, the original tuple comes in from the spout and the enriched tuple comes out from the bolt. Um, something uh, I would like to touch on is the grouping. Um, Storm does have something really cool which will just get to the next slide. You can actually, um, for stateful processing, you can um, make sure that based on, on certain values of the tuple, that it gets passed to the same task for, um, for consistency. So since we're grouping on word, that value will get hashed and then Storm will make sure that tasks um, for, that, for that value will keep going to the same, to the same task, which, is, which can be really useful. Uh, for the bolt, shuffle just means that the, the tuples will get passed around to tasks. Um, it'll, be it'll be balanced out. So the tuples will get allocated out to the tasks fairly so that no, any node, no one node will get rebalanced. Something really cool about um, Storm is that it actually acts and fails. It has a very robust messaging system as the tuples move through, um, move through the graph. So Storm actually acts and fails every individual tuple, which uh, makes, this really, it makes it really easy to do a reliable messaging using Storm. So you can do like at least once, um, exactly once, that sort of thing. You can, you can keep track of, um, of every tuple as it's going through the chain. StreamParse actually implements uh, auto act and auto fail for you, but you can also do your own, uh, you can override those and have, um, you, can, you can specify when, when a bolt acts or when a bolt fails. Uh, a tuple, and then you can replay it right from the spout. So um, it's really fantastic. It has saved us um, quite often. The, the fact that it's kind of like, by its very nature, by the tuple tree's nature, you can actually um, track the, um, the progress of a tuple through the system. Um, I, I won't linger too long here, but Storm also has a really nice UI. Um, if you, once you've deployed Storm to your, your Nimbus, the master node is called a Nimbus, once you deploy to the Nimbus, uh, you can log in via a really cool web interface and you can see topology summaries, you can see um, spout and bolt summaries, you can see number of tuples act and failed, number of tuples emitted, you can see uh, exceptions on each of the workers. It's, uh, it's, it's really useful, it's a great tool uh, for doing real-time distributed computing. Um, and the way, the way it does this is you just have a cluster, uh, you have a Nimbus node or the master node, and you have worker nodes. Uh, each with a certain number of slots that you specify, depending on how com uh, computationally intensive um, what you're doing is. Uh, and then you simply deploy the topologies to this remote cluster, and the topologies, based on what you've configured, will use up the slots of the, uh, of the worker nodes to do the computation. Um, you can run into um, issues of contention there. Of course, if you try to deploy a fifth topology, um, <laughs> there won't be any more space, so you'll t your topology will just uh, kind of sit there with no worker processes. Uh, you, can, you can then rebalance the storm, the storm cluster to take that into account, and stream parts can help you do that. Um, so, storm's pretty cool. Uh, if any of you have been searching for a um, real-time distributed system that can do this at scale, you found it. Um, storm guarantees processing via tuple trees. Uh, you can tune different parallelism for components, so you can have fewer slots or more slots for less or more computationally intensive tasks. 
Uh, it's high availability. If a node drops, st the, the storm cluster can take care of it. Uh, it actually uses Python process slots. Uh, each, each slot actually spawns a new Python subprocess. So it sidesteps the gil. It's all running, it's all multi process, it's not threaded. Um, you can rebalance computationally intensive tasks across your cluster. Uh, and it handles acting and failing and network messaging automatically. Um, and except until now, it was really hard to use it with Python. Um, which brings us to our main thrust. Uh, Storm does. Uh, oops. Um, we want to use Python for this, right? Nobody wants to write Go or Scala, or maybe, maybe you do, but that's not that's not why we're here. We're here to to stick it to all the people who said we couldn't use Python for this. Um, so there is uh, something called a multi-lang protocol uh, that Storm implements, and this allows you to interface with the Storm cluster um, in a different language. Um, Storm does ship with something. If any of you have tried to do this before, you've probably encountered something called storm.py. Has anybody, has anybody encountered storm.py? Yeah. So there's a couple of uh, issues with storm.py, right? Uh, I should have had a slide for this. Uh, it's not really that Pythonic. It's more of a reference implementation than anything. And it's a bit, uh, it's a bit janky. You gotta package up your own jars. There's, um, there's quite a few issues. Um, so we decided that storm.py wasn't really taking into account uh, all of the neat things that Storm's multi-lang protocol allows. Uh, because the multi-lang protocol on its face is actually pretty cool. Um, it supports, um, um, it's just JSON passing back and forth between the Java implementation and the Python shell. Uh, it works via shell-based components, communicates over standard in, standard out. So it's quite clean, very Unix-y. Uh, it doesn't use uh, Py4j, which uh, I don't know if anybody, anybody here uses Spark, but if you've ever, uh, hit a Java stack trace and you're like, how did my code cause that? You, <laughs> you won't have that here. Um, and it's also pretty simple to implement. Um, so, oh, um, sorry, I'm a bit redundant, but yeah, um, one process per task, uh, speaks with JSON, and you can control parallelism. The, the, handshake, the handshake between uh, the Python process and the, the Java implementation will control the configuration and the context of the process. Uh, so it's really neat, but up until a couple years ago, there wasn't really a great way to use Storm. And I should know that, that, that there's two projects that we have. Uh, there's PyStorm, which is really under the hood. It's the multi-lang protocol by which we communicate uh, to Storm. But what, we'll, what we're gonna focus on for the remainder of the lecture is uh, StreamParse, which is your interface to Storm that uses PyStorm under the hood. But we do maintain both. Uh, so. so uh, stream parse. Uh, we initially released it a couple years ago in 2014. Um, it's had over two years of active development and again, heavily, heavily battle tested. Uh, it's got a lot of stars on GitHub. Um, it's got a lot of contributors, 31 contributors, and we have three uh, engineers actively maintaining it. Um, and yeah, it's, it's battle tested. We pass uh, tons of data through it every day, uh, many millions of events, and um, it does great. Um, I was going to do uh, a live installation of StreamParse, but in the interest of time, I'm just gonna, I just pre-prepared some of these commands for you guys. Um, but yeah, all you have to do, uh, it has line, the only, the only outside dependency is line, line again, which is a closure compiler. Um, but once, once you have line installed, just create a new virtual environment, run pip install StreamParse, and then do sparse, which sparse is the, is the command line uh, interface, s parse. Uh, quick start, and then you can just you can just change into the directory that it creates, and you can actually just locally run a storm topology right on your machine. Um, oh, I should have mentioned this. Um, you do need to have the storm development environment set up on your machine, but you can just download that from the Apache Storm website. It's a, it's a quick. It's basically just putting the storm bin on your path. Um, and uh, I do have a GIF of this uh, in action. It's super easy. Um, yeah, and you can see here, you can see it's compiling the jar, it's doing everything for you behind the scenes. And then it's off to the races.
There you go. And you'll notice all of the cores were, were being utilized, so it very neatly sidestepped the gill, and it was a five minute uh, from, uh, well, not even five minutes, but from pip install to fussing with it, uh, which is, you know, we think quite nice. Um, and the same idea, once you have a remote cluster set up and configured, um, you can simply type sparse submit, and there's a small config JSON file that's documented in the help docs that you can, that you give it the, uh, obviously the host name, the parameters, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, and it does all of this, which is really great for deploying. Um, makes a virtual inf across the cluster and installs requirements, builds a jar to the source code, actually opens a tunnel to the Nimbus, constructs the topology spec in memory, and then uploads the jar to Nimbus and starts the topology. So it's actually really great for uh, kind of taking the headache out of deploying. You don't have to worry about jars, don't have to worry about out-of-date requirements or writing a fab file that manually updates all of the virtual environments. Sparse can do this for you. So um, it, it does take a lot of the headache out of kind of deploying these topologies and maintaining them. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, there's a, there's a, a lot of other commands that it has. This is just a quick uh, overview of them. Uh, some of which are diagnostic, some of which are functional, but I encourage you to explore them all. Um, and so this, this is an example of how we use it in production. Um, so we have a couple of spouts coming in, and we actually, um, we actually take the page view events in real time and pass them through the topology and, and batch insert them into an Elasticsearch cluster. Um, and uh, like you can see, it's not a very um, not a very difficult diagram, not a very complicated diagram, um, but it's extremely robust, and it's one that we it's uh, an abstraction, of course, but it's an abstraction of one that we use in production every day. It's being used right now. Um, so there's a you don't have just regular bolts that do just streaming. Uh, you can also have batching bolts, which is great for database. Um, databases don't like to be um, hammered with one at a time uh, insert and update requests. So you can, batch, you can batch a bunch of tuples every one or two seconds or so and do a, and do a one batch operation on them. Um, and so we, there's, there's already classes for that batching bolt and tickless batching bolt. Um, and also remember that we act and fail every individual tuple. So there's also already a class in stream parse um, for, for, for messaging reliability. It's a spout that will automatically replay any tuple up to a certain amount of retries that you specify, which makes it great for easy, easy low latency, high availability messaging, reliable messaging. Um, there are a couple of, I'm on the wire here. There are, <laughs> there are a couple of performance considerations. Um, a couple of you during the multi-lang protocol might have thought, hey, isn't passing JSON a lot of overhead to serialize and deserialize as things move, move through the Topology, the answer is yes. Um, so if you're processing lots of little small messages, it's better to use the batching bolt and, and batch them like once every second or so. Um, and it's best to filter out a lot of those, if you're processing a lot of tuples, filter them out quite early. Um, so you're actually just not passing through as many, uh, as many tuples. Um, don't let grouping overwhelm you. Uh, it seems really nice and convenient to have stateful processing, but if your data is um, Imbalanced. If you have a, if, if one value is ultra common, grouping will swamp that one executor. So use shuffle, unless you have to, um, and use several small topologies instead of one huge one. Uh, it cuts down the amount of work uh, if a tuple fails, it, because remember when a, when a tuple is replayed, it gets replayed all the way from the beginning of the spout. Um, and also, storm is more efficient for, at tuple tracking um, in smaller topologies, which is actually a recommendation we got from the storm devs themselves. Um, and final slide. Uh, cool stuff for we want to do. We want to implement um, uh, Kafka Reader Kafka reader and Writer Bolts, which is one of the huge use cases for stream parse, and Message Pack, which is a binary a serialization format that cuts down the overhead of JSON. And that's it. Um, uh, yeah, that's stream parse, PyStorm, and we're parsely.com. So. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Very interesting. <laughs> Who has a question? So I want to ask, um, why did you decide to use Storm and not, for example, Spark? That's actually, uh, if I had the time, I was going to go into why we didn't use like Spark microbatching. Um, so we actually do use Spark in our uh, in our kind of historical analysis layer, 
but we found that Spark micro-batching doesn't really let you do sub-second sub -second latency. Um, so it just, uh, it just made sense to use Storm, really. But I think if, if you're not worried about latency and you already use Spark, I think micro-batching is a perfectly fine alternative. Here's another one. Okay, so uh, imagine that w I would create a, like a real-time system that aggregates some data. For example, we have like a hundred re requests, how hundred thousand requests per second, okay. and we need to like get some aggregations. For example, you like, put strings like cow, dog, whatever, and I want to tell like how many cows were there in a second, in a minute, in an hour. So, like, do I attach some fast storage to stream parse, or like how would you do that? Um, I can tell you how we do it. Because uh, we, we do something similar, so we, when I was talking about engage minutes and page views, uh, we, we actually aggregate those in Elasticsearch database. And we're not at quite 100,000 requests a second, but we're, we're, in, we're in the ballpark. Um, and the way we do it is we actually have in um, uh, StreamParse writes to um, a Cassandra cluster, which then every, I, I don't know exactly the amount of seconds, but every X amount of seconds, we create like a roll-up document in Elasticsearch, which we then insert with the aggregate count and they're bucketed by timestamp. So um, uh, we, we, you could actually do Elasticsearch to Cassandra, that whole pipeline, actually handles uh, page view by page view quite well. It actually, um, the latency is pretty good. Uh, but you run into issues of storage if, you're have, if you have one Elasticsearch document per page view, which is why we do the aggregate rollups. But I see no reason that wouldn't, a similar situation wouldn't work, doing like aggregate rollup documents in a database. More questions? Uh, uh, thank you for the talk first, and uh, the question is, uh, if we want to deploy it on AWS and support the auto-scaling, uh, what are um, possibilities Storm provides to support auto-scaling? Uh, I'm, I'm actually not sure as far as the auto-scaling goes, unfortunately. Um, we, we do all our node scaling by hand because we use reserved instances. Um, so I'm actually not sure, sorry. Mm. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi, I wanted to I want to ask uh, how uh, the uh, stream parse programming model compares to uh, normal Storm or Trident or I don't know maybe Spark or uh, uh, Flink. Uh, sorry, say again. Uh, how the programming model uh, of uh, stream parse compares to uh, Trident or norm, uh, Core uh, Storm or Flink or Spark? Uh, I'm what are I'm the abstractions and Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, I'm actually not super familiar with Trident, so I can't speak to Trident. Um, but the, the kind of, the kind of um, I think the core abstraction that you would compare the Storm topology to in, uh, in Spark would be the RDD. And in a similar way, um, like from an RDD, you would like fetch data and then perform like different functions on it. You're pa you would pass like, um, you know, you would keep calling different functions like MapReduce or Aggregate or whatever on the Spark <laughs> RDD. Uh, the, the equivalent to that would be Storm's topology, which is you have spouts and bolts, and uh, you, could, you could, I suppose, reimagine the bolts as functions. So this tuple is getting processed through these functions up until the end where it gets loaded or otherwise evaluated somewhere. Um, I suppose it would be the closest abstraction. Okay, maybe one last short question. Uh, you're, that's, a, that's a good one, so that's... You're, you're not the first and you're not the last to ask. Um, so we're basically engineers that focus on... So we, our product team does like actual core development work and features, and we develop anything that is customer-facing or client-facing. So I would work on some of those dashboards or the, the data pipeline ETL or the API stuff would all fall under the realm. So success engineers are engineers who are also... Um, will respond to customers' problems and also work on features that directly impact them. So. Okay. Thanks, Alexander, again. Thank you.